I'm Nicole King, and this is Marbella Now. Hey, hey, it's a brand new day. It's with a saddened heart that I start this week's programme. It's been a week since we heard the news that Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth II passed away. She was elderly, yes we know, but it was still an unexpected news and we're still trying to come to terms with it. I don't think any of us haven't felt in some way marked by the presence of Her Royal Highness and most of us have known her most of our lives. She's always been there, but now she's not. Although not in the UK, many expats are still discussing this. We're all watching everything on the news and on television, following the processions and anxious for the funeral service on Monday. I went out and about to speak to some of the people in our community to see just how they're feeling. Lucy, it's been a few days now since the Queen of England passed away. How are you feeling and what are your thoughts on the Queen? What are you missing the most? All, everything she did was just wonderful. I'm just... It's amazing how much it really it, hits us. I know, I was just... When I was told that she died, I just burst into tears. <laughs> and it was so embarrassing because I was at quiz. <laughs> did you expect to be this upset by her passing? No, no, not at all. I thought she'd go on forever. I think we all did. I mean, we know that nobody is immortal, but I, you just think she'll go on forever. What's her legacy for you? I haven't even got that far yet. I'm still, um, I think her love for everybody and her animals and she just loved everybody. I'm really sorry for your loss, Lucy. And yours. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any um, anecdotes you'd like to share with us? Um, I never met her, so I don't really have any, but I did me meet her mother at the races and I can see how she became who she is through her mother. And she was an amazing woman as well. Um, I think there'll never be anyone like our queen. I loved seeing her at the races when our horses were I'd say I'm going <laughs> um, and her face when her horses ruck one um, her with her dogs and she was just wonderful and your message to King Carlos III <laughs> our new king I think he's an amazing man and I think he'll do such a good job I really do Long live the king. Absolutely. <laughs> You're all here toasting the queen, but also the new king. The new king, yes. How, where were you when you found out about the death of our queen? I was um, at home with my wife, but it was, um, I don't think it was that unexpected. Uh, we had slight advance warning for various um, reasons I won't go into in detail, but uh, Obviously, it came as a huge shock, but um, as some people have already said, it's a, it's a it's a very very sad time. But it's actually in another sort of way, it's the dawn of a new beginning. And um, I particularly was very lucky to have served Her Majesty for several years when I was a young officer in the British Army, and I remember meeting her on, on a couple of occasions. And I think one of the things that's um, come out recently is, is that amazing radiant smile she had and I remember when um, I was a young very young many years ago I was joining the army and I had to get an interview with the colonel of the regiment who was a, a frosty old chap called Field Marshal Sir Gerald Templer and young officers in the Hillsdale Cavalry had to have an interview to see if you're a sort of okay sort of chap to join the regiment the, the blues and royals as, as we became which as you know Prince Harry and Prince William were in and I many years before, but um, anyway, I had to have tea with Lady Templar somewhere in uh, 
Old Grave at Eton, Mews, North, or was it South, or was it East, or was it West? And at four o'clock, punctual, and I got there at quarter past four, and I rang the doorbell, and there was this fierce man, the, the, the uh, field marshal, who was very famous for clearing out the communists in Malaya. And uh, he was a wonderful man, but that's another story. And he looked at me in the eye with his dazzling eyes and his sort of down the eyebrows and said, the first thing you learn, boy, is punctuality. And he dragged me up the stairs. And I was sitting there shaking my hands with a cup of tea and Lady Tempest said, Gerald, don't be nice to this, don't be horrible to this nice young man. I'm sure, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, at the end of tea, he said, well, you'll do, you'll do. And that was it. Anyway, one year later, the Queen comes to Windsor to give us our new um, regimental colours. Uh, we're all lined up in the officer's mess. Um, we're told how to behave. You know, you don't put your hand out. She puts her hand out and you take her hand and she may talk to you, she may not. And she was with Colonel Gerald and um, walking along and um, she stopped in front of me and put her hand out. And she said, oh, yes, you were the one that was late but with a wonderful smile on her face. I thought, goodness me, I mean, she meets thousands of people a year and she can remember that, or presumably the Colonel told her. The Colonel now being uh, Princess Royal, uh, Princess Anne that was, and um, but that's another story. Wow, so you, it's, a, it's a very special connection with the Royal family. Well, I have met uh, the Princess Royal a couple of times, I and mean, quite recently, actually, because the... Um, the 50th anniversary of the Blues and Royals amalgamation, the Royal Horse Guards, the Blues, the Royals, the Royals was a year ago and I was one of the lucky, I think my only claim to military fame, I was the first sort of officer to be commissioned into the, the amalgamated regiment. So they only invited a hundred officers to St. James's for this dinner. And then she walked the Colonel. In all her splendor, she looked incredibly regal. And I was talking to the old, my old adjutant, Andrew Parker Bowles, you know, Camilla's ex-husband, who I obviously knew very well. And um, he was, she came straight up to Andrew, beetled up to him, and said, oh, he gave her a kiss. And he said, he said, Colonel, have you met, because you, you dressed in orders, your Royal Highness, or, because she's the Colonel, we call her Colonel, you know, she's our Colonel. He said, do you know this um, reprobate from our bear? Michael Corrie said, oh, how exciting, my bear. And um, I turned around and said, well, I think Andrew's being a little bit um, poetic licensed there. I mean, really, it's a very, very, very nice place and not quite the reputation that some people deem it to have. Don't you think, Andrew? And I turned around and he disappeared and he was waving at me 20 yards away. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And that, anyway, we had a wonderful chat and she's, she's a very wonderful, amusing lady. And I think it's very poignant that uh, Her Majesty the Queen, on you know, her final wishes, deemed that Anne would be escorting me a cortege from Balmoral to Edinburgh, or from Hollywood House to Edinburgh, her and her own. Her little girl. Her little girl. Thank you. Not at all. Dean, you arrived yesterday from South Africa. That's right, yeah. Welcome. Thank you. I hope you're going to have a lovely time living in Marabella. I'm sure I will. You are from one of the colonies, our empire, the British Empire. Yes, yeah. Is that offensive to say that? How do you feel about our Queen, the Royal Family, the loss of our Queen. I think I'm a bit young to give a, a strong opinion on it, but I've noticed a lot of people in South Africa have felt very distraught about the loss of the Queen, and it was quite a big shock to everyone. But for myself, like I said, I feel like I'm a bit too young to actually know all that she did. Linda Wood, and I know you're a big fan of the Royal Family. Yes. How did you take the news of the passing of our Queen? Oh, I, I don't know why, but both James and myself suddenly had tears rolling down our faces. It was awful, you know, because I knew she wasn't well and they said she's comfortable. And I had such a shock when that final, she has passed away, um, came through. I think we got it at 6.30 and she had passed away at 4.30 but um, very, very, very sad. You know, the Queen has always been there when I've been around, basically. Um, she was always a very strong woman. She traveled all the colonies. She, um, she, she kind of cared about people and therefore we care about her and, and, and what she has left behind because I think that um, King Charles, as he is now, he, 
has taken her mantra, I think, and he will go forward with what she has done for the colonies. You know, because uh, I grew up not in the UK, but uh, I grew up obviously in Africa. And she was the most amazing person that we all looked up to and her mother. You know, so the mother came to visit us a few times. My mother, my mother met her, but we never met um, the queen. However, am I allowed to tell you a little ditty? Because my family, my father's family come from um, Balmoral, Bremar area. And my father's younger brother was a vet. And the queen happened to fall within his remit. So he was always at Balmoral Castle and Bremar looking after her, well, basically her deer, her horses, and the domestic animals, which were obviously the cats and dogs and so on. The corgis. The, the corgis, corgis, yes. He looked after all of them. And uh, he recounts a story about one particular day he was attending to her horses. She was there with him. And uh, she said, I think my horse has da 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 da. And he knew that the queen was wrong. And he didn't know how to say to her, I'm sorry, ma'am, but I think they've got whatever they had. Um, anyway, she, he sort of mentioned, possibly they may have whatever it is. And she said, yes, Ian, you're right. Absolutely right. So it was quite sweet, but he loved going to Balmoral. And obviously, as I say, he looked after all her, her deer, you know, on the mountains. So every year he'd get a couple of weeks that they could stay on the private estate of the royal family. Very down to earth people. It very, be. very down to earth. And an aunt had her come into her shop a lot in Balata and she bought quite a few little bits and pieces from her. But she never ever wanted to, she wanted to be low key, you know, come in, do her thing and go away. So for that, I admire um, the Queen. She was a wonderful, wonderful woman. And I think we'll all miss her hugely. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. How was your reaction, your perception to the news of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II? Uh, well, one could hardly sort of say one was over surprised, but um, it was still heart wrenching, um, great loss. Um, to the community, but I'm sure that our new king is going to be a very fine replacement. He's waited um, a long time for this position. He has indeed. And what few people know about him is that he's an extremely fine watercolour painter. And he usually takes, and when he goes out on one of his trips to a foreign country, he usually takes an artist with him. And he took one called James Hart Dyke who we were having an exhibition of in our gallery in Bruton Street. And so um, the Prince decided that he would like to come and see the exhibition, but it had to be privately done. Um, when so it was nine o'clock at night, it was arranged for. And he was perfectly charming. He came, he chatted and looked at the pictures and um, it was a thoroughly successful evening. So, wow, I wouldn't, didn't expect to actually meet someone who knew the King of England. Well, he wasn't King then, he was only a, a mere prince. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Hi there, thank you for letting me stop you jogging along the passé. I was sorry to interrupt. Do you happen to have any thoughts on the passing of the Queen of England? Well, yes, indeed. I mean, I'm Irish, but nonetheless, I... I think and a lot of people would say worldwide that she was a, a wonderful woman. Um, she was a, a definitely an icon for, for Great Britain, but she was also an icon for strong women. And um, I think she will be missed. It was an end of an era. Um, yeah, I, I think she was a great woman and I'm very glad that she came to visit Ireland and she came to visit the um, market in Cork, the city I'm from, and met the fishmonger, which is a very famous photograph that's there now. Um, I think that goes to show the fact that she really wanted unity, and I admire that. Thank you. Very well.
Queen Elizabeth undeniably has touched the lives of all of us. Thank you very much for those members of our community who have shared their feelings and experiences with us. It was actually very, very interesting and quite surprising who you can bump into in Marbella. Such is the case with my first guest today. His name is Ronnie and he comes as an introduction from Juan Carlos Berenguer, a very dear friend, who is collaborating with Ronnie on an ambitious new project, Costa del Sol, 365 coming up this weekend in the Palacio de Congresos, the exhibition center in Estepona. Hi, Ronnie. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. The event's happening well. in Estepona, but we're kissing cousins. It's extended Golden Mile. Yes. So delighted to let everybody know what's going on and what you've prepared. Yes. Well, our project is uh, now a reality, you know. Uh, it's been called, uh, it has been called uh, Costa del Sol 65 Wellness 360 Degrees, another number, and Luxury Healthy Lifestyle. It's maybe a long name with a lot of concepts, and basically we had begun with this project before the COVID situation, but uh, nowadays uh, it is more necessary than ever the, to live with wellness, with health, uh, to live as well in peace with others and with uh, ourselves. So that, that's why we have decided to launch this project. This project uh, is, uh, as well is because all the people in Costa del Sol from Malaga to Gibraltar, basically, we are a family, all, all we are living together. And people is, is uh, asking for healthy food, sports, uh, beauty, the girls, and a lot of concepts so we have launched this project this uh, will uh, take part uh, beginning on this fridays the 16th saturday 17th and sunday the 18th of september as you have said in the palacio de congresos uh, and exposition exhibitions of estepona it's like a trade show but it's for all the people and for all the families you will uh, know uh, the last techniques in uh, our um, conferences in about yoga, about health, about sports. You will have testings or fruits or uh, healthy food and uh, also um, performances of uh, yoga mindfulness experts, uh, oriental techniques like Tai Chi, for example and uh, a lot of uh, different stuff. So it's going to be like an interactive trade fair, so a lot of things to go find out, to try and to explore because there are new techniques that come out, new things that happen and we're all so busy working. But I think having mentioned COVID, during that time we all had time to reflect and maybe realise that we need to shift priorities and I think many of us forget to put attention on ourselves and in a very busy, fast world, almost like it's wrong to spend time on oneself. It's selfish, but it's the opposite. It's kind of necessary to yes. indulge just a little bit. Be people is demanding that. I, 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 I come from the real estate uh, business, and I have been uh, with great and big builders in, in Madrid and uh, here in the south of Spain, and people... Uh, People won't buy you today a flat, an apartment, without a balcony, without a terrace. So just, it's just an example, you know. So in, in, during these days, you, you will have people showing you have to... Um, there, there will be private spaces where you can be the, teached uh, with uh, a professor or whatever, uh, techniques of uh, yoga, mindfulness, yeah. And then it will be very interesting and it's necessary. What is the um, format for going in? Do you have to register? Is it free? Uh, yeah, you, uh, there's in, a, um, in the website www.costadelsol365.org. Uh, you have, you can buy the tickets uh, in advance through Eventbrite platform, uh, through the website of Eventbrite. It's just two euros. It's a symbolic price because uh, the entrance will, will be uh, donated uh, for uh, two uh, N NGOs. One is uh, Paula and the in Spanish Medula uh, Fabric. And the other one is Fundatul. Uh, and one is for uh, children cancer, uh, you know, problem. And the other one is for... Uh, 
um, boys and girls with special uh, needs, and things. needs, mental needs, you know. Well, very, very worthy causes that you're donating the entrance fee to. So basically it is free, just a two-year yes. donation to the charities, which I think is lovely. How many exhibitors, more or less, yes, do you we have? We have uh, around 50 exhibitors. Wow. Which is which is good, and uh, you 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 will ha you will find people from art, decoration, fashion. There will be also a fashion runaway on Sunday with girls from Estepona and from Marbella, but but not models. Just people like you and me, you know, uh, uh, because we we want to to make it real, you know. And uh, I, 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 we hope people people enjoy it. You you will have a lot of like 20 performances, conferences to choose about from uh, emotional intelligence, which will be these conferences of emotional intelligence will will be uh, presented by Antonio Carmona, which is an Spanish intellectual who has been working at NASA. For example, and in big company, he has written like uh, 30 books. There will be a beauty uh, conference and beauty techniques for uh, for women in menopausia, given by Andrea Ropolo, which is the, the creator of a um, beauty line with uh, karité oil. It really does sound fascinating. So if people go to the website, Costa del Sol, 365.org, they can see who's talking and doing what on each exactly, day. Exactly. So they exactly. can choose to go one day in particular or all three. Uh, it's, it's, it's for, the ticket is for one day in particular, but you can come yes, Exactly. Can if there's come something back, that's interesting, it, then... By, by two years, it doesn't matter. And, uh, and, and the, our website is, of course, in English and Spanish, but also it has an uh, APP that uh, it's uh, translated at the same time, like in 40 languages. So everybody is welcome from 10.30 to 9 p.m. Uh, at... Uh, Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday and yes. Sunday. Yes. Ronnie, delighted to meet you. Congratulations. I was definitely trying to make it along, and I look forward to seeing you again in the near future. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this really does sound like something worthy to do this weekend. We might even learn something and have a good time. And there's room for uh, 500 cars the parking area around the convention center of now that is a very important point really easy parking too easy parking costa del sol 365 coming up this weekend at the exhibition center in estepona ronnie thank you thanks a lot guys don't go away boys and girls ladies and gentlemen back in just a moment with more of what's going on in marbella now <laughs> Joining me now is a lovely young lady. Her name is Claire, and she's from TLE CBD Company. But I know of the company as the Leaf Elite, as it was presented at a CBD dining extravaganza at Miss Raw at the Marbella Arena just some weeks ago. So, following that, I was intrigued to know a little bit more. I'd never been to a dinner with CBD before. And I thought it would be nice to actually meet the person behind the concept and find out a bit more. So, Claire, welcome to Marbella now. Thank you very much, Nicole. Lovely to meet you. How long have you been on the coast? I've been here over 20 years. Oh, so you're a, you're a real local. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely love it here. Came here for the climate, stayed and worked for my dad, and now I'm obviously working with CBD and cannabis. So, How did I'm you get involved with that? I mean, like, it's a, an interesting... <laughs> topic and very interesting to see the results that are happening health-wise with all these yeah. treatments so it's nice to catch up and hear from you well I it wasn't I had two friends that died of cancer and one of them uh, got access to some oil and it helped her and that is how I started I thought oh my gosh how did this oil help her and we didn't know about it so from that I started researching into how cannabis plant works and I was astounded to find that we've been doing lots of research and from the 60s it started and um, once I found out that CBD was non-psychoactive and you could help it to use it, to use it for any type of health from young to old that I decided that I would like to join the cannabis community and started my own company. That so what, did you, what do you actually do? So 2018 just mm -hmm. One, one year pre-pandemic, so just getting going, I imagine, when <laughs> things went yeah. a little haywire. Yeah. But what is, does the company entail? What do you actually do with so, this oil? So, 
first of all, I started, I wanted to cultivate here because actually in Spain, we were one of the first people to cultivate. We used to cultivate hemp here legally and we do cultivate it legally. But the problem is when you cultivate it here in Spain, you grow it, you need to send it out of the country to get it processed to send it back. So I started to look at farms, what different farms were producing here and looking at different suppliers to find out the best products. And I started off with just oil, but I re um, 2019, I collaborated with Heart Genetics, which also worked with DNA testing, so that we could also put the science behind the plant. So the DNA testing, you can find out whether we've got receptors in our body that respond to cannabinoids. So I found that that was really helpful if we had anyone that was seriously ill, so with epilepsy or cancer, that they could find out whether they could possibly take cannabis and if it would benefit them. So there's actually a gene in our body that you can test to see whether this would be there appropriate. There are many genes. So we've got these, so in the 1990s, um, Raphael Mishulium and a team of other people, one of them was called Lemur Henus, that I also met in Israel, um, they discovered the endocannabinoid system. And this endocannabinoid system is in all of us. It's even in animals, and that's why you can use CBD with dogs and cats and etc. So once that we found this discovery that we had these different receptors inside us, we know now that if we take the oil, the oil will infiltrate our system to bring us into homeostasis, a place of balance. So how I look at it is I don't find it as, we were talking about alternative medicine, but I find it's very good to use as a therapy alongside other treatments. So if people have had unsuccessfully have been unsuccessful in treating different types of symptoms, then they could try CBD and, they, and they might find that it will help them bring them into balance. I mean, the endocannabinoid system controls your central nervous system, hormone regulation and immune health. So when you take it, you're going to find that you could have less problems with anxiety, inflammation, pain, mood, it helps with lots of different things. And how does one take it? How is this prescribed for, is it? Or, you can take it in different forms. I mean, I started off with just an oil that you took in your, under your, underneath your tongue. But as I found a lot with older patients, older clients, that they were used to taking capsules, etc., or pills off a doctor. So I looked at, then at capsules. So we do two different types of capsules, a soft gel capsule and a capsule that I use with piperine, a black pepper extract that helps the absorption of the cannabinoids. And how did I come to be having dinner with a CBD experience? Where did that part come from? Because I absolutely love the plant and Cara also believes in CBD herself. And I, my first event, I started doing events all over the country. I worked with Urban Chai, um, Amara. We tried to educate people on how to use it. And obviously a good way of using it is in foods and especially gastronomical foods. So apart from Miss Raw, I also, we also have a cocktail at the monkey club that was created by Don Diego Zapata. So you must go in there to enjoy that. But we're doing a CBD um, cannabis event where we use CBD with yoga in the UK. So I try to educate people on how to use the plant in the most beneficial way to them. Does it have any side effects? Are there any counterindications? And that's why I said about using the DNA test. So if you have got any queries or you are using different medication and you've got any problems that you may think that this may have a problem with you, then you can use the DNA test. And is that something that you have? You have these DNA tests yeah, and so everything? You do, do all this stuff? Yeah, I do all this stuff. It's like I also work with different massage people. Um, I use a massage oil that we have CBD in that also help the receptors because we've got more receptors on our body, on our skin than anywhere else. How do people come to see you? Where do you have a specific I place? Do you visit other people's places? Yes, I do. I go around visiting lots of different places. So we've got our products all across the coast. Um, but here in Marlborough, I, I specifically work with Aura Clinic, you know, Aura Wellness, which is on the port near La Sala. So I work with them directly so you can come and book an appointment to see me there. Well your family must be very proud you set yourself up with a nice little business and obviously something you're passionate about. I absolutely love it and once I saw how this can positively affect people's lives then I really think that it's something that people should look at to try and improve their health and if it can help you or help someone then you know then why not give it a try. Undeniably. Is it expensive? No it depends on where you get your, where you're sourcing it from but 
for example, with 30 capsules, my vegan capsules for 30, uh, for 40 euros, just 30 capsules. You can take one a day and help regulate your system. So I don't think it's too expensive. No, not at all, especially when it comes to, comes to our health. And if it's something That's that right. works, that alleviates pain and helps in many different ways, but I'm sure that you have further information you can give people if they are interested to learn more. For sure, if they want to contact me, I've also got my Instagram page at the Leaf TLC, which they can always DM me and ask me any questions, and I'm always happy to help guide them on their wellness journey with cannabinoids. Well, I'm really glad, happy that we got a chance to meet. Thanks, I did enjoy the whole idea of having a CBD it was dining great, wasn't experience. It? <laughs> it, was it was, it was definitely nice. And it's nice to know that things like this are now coming out more into the mainstream because a lot of times the pharmaceutical companies are just so against things, but only because it's not in their economic interests. So I think it is very important to do, as Claire has done, and do your own research, do your investigation, and check it out, because there are many scientific studies that are proving that there are. this is definitely the way to go. Mm -hmm. There are. I mean, I just recently spoke at a medical cannabis conference in Israel in March, and a man called Didi Miri, who's the latest scientist, he's actually researching 500 different strains of cannabis to find out what impact it has on specific cancers. So, um, yes, we're 10 years now, this is going to be new, but we're still at the, the seedling stage and it's about educating and creating awareness about how this plant can work and I just, uh, in, in Please go out there and do your research, find out what company you're going to be buying it from because at the moment we have issues in the CBD um, industry where a lot of companies have just jumped on board, they don't exactly know what they're selling, so just make sure you're getting it from a good supplier and do your research over that as well. Well, obviously you're doing your research, so a good place to start is right here <laughs> with, with Claire. Lovely to meet you, thank you ever so much for thank your you, time. Thank you, Nicole, thank you very much. Don't go away, back again in just a moment. Hey, hey. Zero Hero, welcome here, here at, at the Gaucho de Maroons. Hey, hey. Joining me now is a well-known face on Marbella now, Evanina of the Butterfly Children Charity. Deborah, Evanina, lovely to see you again. Nice to see you too. Thank you for having us. It's always too long. We're always yeah. so busy, but it's nice at least that we do get these get-togethers. Absolutely. And at Thank least you. to catch up with what's going on in the association. Yeah. And Before we start with events, fundraising, could you just give a little summary for those people who still may not know yeah. what this affliction is all about, yeah, what it's about. So, and yeah, definitely. Thank you for the opportunity to raise awareness because, as we always say, this is a condition that can happen to anyone. So this is a condition called technically epidermolysis bullosa, um, but it's more well known by butterfly skin or butterfly children. Uh, one in every 227 people are carriers of the condition without knowing. So if uh, a mummy is carrier, you know, meets a dad, you know, or meets a man who is a carrier as well. They they have a 25% chance of having a child with a condition, and basically this child is born without the gene that allows them to produce the proteins that hold the skin together and, and make the skin resistant. So you know when we normally you know have a shower, have a hug, you know that our skin resists that. In their case, they're missing proteins such as collagen, which means that any friction, with any friction, their skin comes off. So they have to be bandaged all of their life and they're born with this condition however when mummy's pregnant um, there's, uh, no they, indication. They go, there's no indication of it and it's only when the baby comes out of the protection of mummy's wound, uh, womb that you know that friction starts happening and and wounds start appearing and blisters and when the alarm bells go off but at that point because it's a rare condition, most health professionals in that hospital have never come across the condition. They don't know how to treat it. So thankfully, nowadays, you know, we've been to so many dermatology congresses and pediatrician congresses, and we've raised awareness about the condition that sometimes they say, oh, this might be butterfly skin. They call us. And thanks to the funding that the charity gets through membership, through people giving five euros uh, a month, or the charity shops, or the events that we do throughout the year, thanks to that funding, you know, the funds that we raise, we fund nurses, social workers, and psychologists that within 24 hours are at the hospital helping the family and helping the health professionals because it's so scary for, yeah. 
it's incredibly scary for a family. You know, they're expecting a healthy baby. And, and there's no warning. There's no warning whatsoever. No preparation yeah, for and, the situation. And if they look on the internet, we will say, please don't look on the internet because what you'll find will be so scary. You know, let's just deal a day at a time. At the beginning, you know, our psychologists always explain that at the beginning, parents have to go through bereavement because they have to bereave the idea of the baby they had. You know, that, that sort of dream, you know, they were going to have a baby that was maybe, you know, going to like, I don't know, gardening or football or... And all the clothes you know, they bought for exactly, it to wear. Exactly, yeah, so exactly. So all the labels have to come off because even the friction of the label will cause wounds. Um, but the good thing is that thanks to, you know, people's support, we have... Our nurses, we have our psychologists, they go within 24 hours to any hospital anywhere in Spain. So some people think it's a charity only for Marbella, but it's the, the charity headquarters for the whole of Spain are in Marbella, but it is for the whole of Spain. So they will go to any hospital in Spain. They leave whatever they're doing. They leave their own families. They're just an amazing team. Go to the hospital, train the health professionals who are often as scared as the parents, obviously not, not in a bereavement state, but they are scared as well. We take all the bandages or the dressings because if you think of a dressing you know when you get a wound you put a dressing and there's sort of the outside the of the dressing mark, sticks yeah. to your skin but those dressings can't be used with children with EB because once you t remove them it takes the skin away so we take all the you know the wound care materials so that the hospital will know what they need to buy in we teach all the hospital staff how to deal with condition and just make sure that the baby has the least possible pain that the baby can be taken home by, by his parents or her parents and, and taken care of as, as well as possible. And then, you know, there are different stages in their life. You know, when it comes to starting um, nursery or school, you can imagine that's an incredibly scary moment for parents because the baby has always been under their protection, you know, under their care, and suddenly they're going to have to leave. You know, their precious baby, their fragile baby with people who know nothing about the condition. So our team will also travel to the school, teach all of the students in the school, the nursery and the teachers so that they know, you know, how to what react. If, yeah, if suddenly, you know, the child falls over and suddenly loses all of the skin of, you know, his oh. leg. Or it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny because over the years and it's years now, a decade that I've been hearing about this and, yeah. and, and under, trying to understand and obviously supporting it. And I know that Don Fisher, the Lower Golf Club, have been every year doing these major galas. Yeah. But it was only a few months ago, and he was sitting with me, we were having lunch, and my little doggy jumped up and scratched his leg, and it was mm -hmm. like a major wound. Yeah. And I suddenly thought, it's that old, without being offensive, Uncle, yeah. that elderly thin person, skin. thin skin. And I suddenly thought, ah, mm. you're seeing it, how easily yeah. that it's damaged, and yeah. then without that reparation process going yeah. in. Yeah, and as a parent, you... You know, you always want to protect your children, always. There's nothing, you know, I think any parent would sign anywhere, you know, okay, make sure my child is well for, you know, until I'm no longer around, you know. Obviously longer than that, and we would all do that. And when you have a child with EB, you just have to change it. And you obviously still think the same, but you have to learn how to care for them. You have to learn to, to avoid causing them wounds with, you know, a, a hug that is a bit rougher than, than usual, or a shower, or... And yeah, it's it's not easy, but that's a great thing. At least the you guys are there. The charity's there. And yeah. apart from the the work of actually taking the teams going and the education, mm. you've also were very heavy into lobbying to try yeah. and get costs covered exactly. by the government because consistent bandaging and treating exactly. these wounds a lifetime of mm. costs. Absolutely. I know that the COVID pandemic interfered with your funding. Yeah. And with that, how are you managing to Well, I think for many years there were many countries uh, in Europe where all that bandaging material that they need on a daily basis, so a wound care routine for someone with the condition with EB can take between two to five hours a day. Um, so families quite need to be quite imaginative, you know, to keep the child or the adult entertained during that time. There's a lot of pain involved and, you know, and all that wound care material for many years in Spain, it had to be paid for by the family. So the pa family's paying up to 2,000 euros a month oh. on wound care material, material, and those families that couldn't afford it could basically not care for their children in the best possible way, you know, with the best practices and the best wound care material because they couldn't afford it. So, like you say, through a lot of lobbying, a lot of time, a lot of knocking doors and a lot of, you know, changes of government and everything, but through our persistence and our passion and you know we managed in 2015 to get you know an agreement between all the different um, autonomous communities because as you know in Spain 
Unfortunately, it's not it's the so Ministry of Exactly. So, if, you know, we used to go to the Ministry of Health, and they said, no, you've got to talk to, you know, the 17 autonomous communities. So man we managed to convince them all that to please, you know, fund this material for the families. So that was amazing breakthrough for us because it was and but still what an achievement i mean so i yeah. mean i know because that's what i did in madrid that kind of yeah. work, driving people mad in the institutions so that's long. a long yeah. that's a lot it takes of work very long yeah. it takes very long it is incredibly discouraging at times i'm not gonna i'm not gonna lie you know and that's where the team comes in you know we sort of help each other and we say come on we've got to keep going we you know that you know the families deserve it but there are still other things that we're lobbying for but it's definitely a, a big part of our work and and you know, as many foreigners know in, in Spain, it's the red tape is, is huge in Spain. So to get to the right person at the right time isn't always easy. But we're there, you know, we're going to keep going. We have a very efficient team. It. It's a very, it, it's a very well-oiled machine. Everybody yeah, cares. Passionate. Everybody works hard. Yeah. So the good thing is that it's, it's yeah. very well structured. So and uh, I think they're very vocational and they're very passionate about what they do. And you see that, you know, in day to day, whether it's a nurse or someone on the communications teams or the fundraising, they really, you know, they feel the, the condition they, they they love the families and and, and the sponsors great too you have yeah. very very loyal yeah. and dedicated sponsors yeah. I mean the lower golf tournament is one of them you've got a yeah. tournament coming up this yeah. weekend tell yeah. us more yeah well I think it's one of those causes that once you know about it it touches you doesn't it in especially your if you've got kids I mean yeah. I think of my children's juicy chubby lovely skin exactly. and it, yes yeah. it makes you think yeah, yeah it makes you um, yeah, so this weekend we have an event. We have a golf event and a dinner. Uh, it's the 20th anniversary of this event. It's held at the Aloha Golf Club. So for people who love golf, it's an amazing course. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful courses on the coast, as everyone knows. <laughs> we love them. Um, and they're incredibly generous with us. Um, and then that same day in the evening, we have a charity dinner. And some of the golfers come, and then people who haven't golfed. But it's a beautiful evening on a beautiful terrace. It's a gala. It's a gala. It really yeah. is. It's a very. It's, a, it's lovely. It's, a, it's an exquisite it's lovely. event. Yeah, and um, and we have two great shows this year. So we have a ballet flamenco show, and then we also have the Rat Pack, which is you know Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin. So yeah, really looking forward to that. I um, imagine that it's be difficult now to get into playing golf as it's this weekend. But are there any availabilities to? come to the dinner because there's raffles and there's ways yeah. of heavily donating during yeah, dinner as exactly. well. Yeah, definitely. So golf, I think tomorrow is a sort of cut-off point, uh, the registration cut-off point, and I think we're nearly full. So, And the dinner, yeah, they can still call us. It's a beautiful terrace. It's such an amazing event. And like you say, you know, you can buy the raffle. You can enjoy the show for a good cause. It's just fantastic. And for us, for the charity, it's just a great opportunity to be able to say hello to everyone, say thank you. You know, we've had two years of not being able to see people and just saying thank you for your help, you know, thank you for being part of the Deborah family. That's going to mean a lot to us to be able to get together. So. And if you don't know what to wear to the gala, pop along to the charity <laughs> shops because they have an amazing selection Absolutely. of all kinds of cocktail and evening wear, Absolutely. apart from everything else at the Butterfly Absolutely. Children's it's charity shop. It's dangerous to go into one of those charity shops. I, I pick really up some is. lovely things well, when I go. Well, this is the thing. You can't always. go in without picking something up, whether it's decoration, whether it's a book, whether it's something to wear, it's a, you know, a gift. It's, yeah. But it's great because obviously that helps to to fund you know our healthcare team and the research that we do in the What charity. kind of money do you look at a year needing to, to bring in to just so, to do the basics? Yeah, so the ba well we would call the basics it's our healthcare team so that that's the team that actually you know are there with the family the essential. travel throughout Spain yeah and that the families couldn't live without or that just you know genuinely really need the support and that's between six and seven hundred thousand a year. Wow. Mm, yeah. But we, you know, we get there every year. Some someone comes up, or, or a different entity comes up and says, "Come on, we're going to help." Or you know, lots of different little, pe you know, people come and help, and and that's fantastic too because it's a condition that can happen to anyone. The more people know about the condition, the better. Because you know, if it were to happen to someone who's listening to the program today and they'd never heard of it, if it happened, you know, they had a child with a condition, a grandchild, they're going to know. Or a friend or a neighbor. Exactly. At least there's some now kind you've of heard exactly. of it, and you're like. Oh, there's a charity called Deborah. We can call them, and they can provide nurses. You know, they do research, and that's what we're all about. You know, making sure that the families do not have to, you know, travel this sort of new journey alone. That they have someone next to them, have someone telling them how to puncture the the, the blisters, how to bandage, how to bath your child, how to everything. You know.
Yeah, I mean, I know that one of the campaigns you did was the ca child car seat, yeah. and you can't put them in because it's like putting knives into yeah, their skin, and yeah. it's just the basic things that we take for granted. Totally, and eating, you know, because often the wounds are often in the inside exactly, as well. Exactly, people often think the wounds are only on the outside, but they're on the inside. So many, many of our, our members have what you call a gastrostomy, so it's a tube that goes straight into the stomach, so they get fed through there, so through their mouth. But they, they don't eat. even get the joy of having to eat. So they and get the joy of eating what they like, but they, they're not determined by what they eat through their mouth because thankfully they have the gastrostomy and that gives them enough energy and nutrition The costs to deal. and, the, and the, the suffering. I know. It is a very, very painful condition. It is, yeah. And that's why we exist, you know, that's why the parents who set up the charity did it because they felt so alone, there was no information, the health, you know, when you're in a hospital, you expect the health professionals to know, you know, what, what, what they're dealing with, to give you the answers, to reassure you, but this is one of those conditions that you're in the hospital and you feel, you know, more abandoned and more lonely than anywhere else in the world because y you feel yeah. alone, so... And then that whole pilgrimage, like that Lorenzo's oil, exactly. to try and find out what to do, and exactly. you guys know what to do. Exactly. So, so it straight makes away, a big difference. There, you know, with the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Evanina, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. You guys are awesome. What can thank I you. say? It's like You're humbled awesome in your presence. For helping us, you know, well, we in do our each journey. One, each one we do a little bit. Yeah. And you can all thank do you. your little bit if you'd like to do a private yeah. event and with birthdays or something and just thank ask you. for, instead of gifts, to have donations to the Butterfly That's Children. A great you can idea. do parties, all kinds of things you can yeah. do. Yeah, everything helps. We say we're a small charity. Every little bit helps, and it helps hugely. Yeah. Oh, Evelina, well done. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, um, anything you can do to help with uh, the Butterfly Children Charity is really hot in here, and I've got cold goosebumps <laughs> every time. It's like, it oh, never gets easier. It never gets easier. It yeah. never gets easier. I psych myself up every time I can, I can do this, I can do this, mm. because we need to. Exactly. And uh, that's exactly. how we get through. We do it for the families. Yeah. We do it for the families. Mm. Okay, guys, well, we're nearly coming to the end of the show, but not over yet. It's been a long summer, and in fact, I've put away. You would think that it would be the other way around, but no. But eating healthy is important, and sometimes we don't really know what we should be eating. But my next guest, Sarana Filipescu, is going to give us some tips. Don't go away. Back in a moment. Hey, hey. Many people say we are what we eat, and actually I think that's a lot of truth in that. Joining me, as promised, now is Serana Filipescu, and we're going to talk about what we eat, because I think a lot of the times we eat the wrong things, but maybe we don't even know what we should be eating. And as Serana knows everything, always studying, always learning, I thought it'd be nice to have her come back to the program and give us some information on food. Serana, lovely to see you again. Lovely to see you again. Thank you for having me. What a nice time we had at the Magna Marbella Club Med opening the other day. It was amazing. Very nice food there. <laughs> very nice food. <laughs> it was very delicious. I don't know if it was the right food to eat, but it was delicious. It was certainly delicious. So exactly. a big thank you to Mary Noel of Marino Communications for that invitation for all. What a wonderful event. So uh, yeah. very nice. But particularly we were talking then about delicious, the mojando, the dipping, the sauces, the spices and not necessarily the best things. Well, I know that. <laughs> Coming out of the summer, going into winter now, it's typically a time to eat. Mm -hmm. When we sit at home and we have those longer dinners and big meals, what should we be paying attention to? What do you think we sh need to take into consideration? We should eat everything that we, n we like, with some exceptions, of course. Uh, we have been taught to eat also Things are changing. We have been told to eat like every two hours, it's good for our health. And now uh, we have a lot of scientific evidence, strong scientific evidence that it's actually not quite as good to eat every two hours. It's very, it's better to do like a fasting time when your body is also like taking a break from all the digestion and all the work. 
but also there are very important nutrients that you have to take in consideration when you are planning your meal in order to get all the metabolic needs to, to have a healthy life. Uh, it is said that food, you are what you eat, as you said, or let food be your medicine. And uh, coming back to, the, to, the, to one research that I liked in particular, it's in 2017, a doctor, a uh, Japanese doctor, Dr. Shishen, Shishen, I think I'm pr pronouncing it correct, uh, with his team, they ran some research with bees. And we know that almost uh, the majority of all, all the bees are working bees. But what uh, makes the difference between a queen and a working bee? Actually, they found out it's what they're eating. The bee, it's like, it's like a human being, I will get there. Uh, when a bee is born, it, and it's, it's fed with uh, pollen, with raw pollen, Raw pollen, it's a, um, it's a product that's very rich in microRNA. So this, it's actually blocking some genes, uh, gene expression, in order for the bee to become a bee, a uh, uh, queen. So in, uh, in the ch on the other side, it's the queens are fed only with royal jelly. This royal jelly doesn't have too much microRNA. So it, de it can develop and it can be, she can transform in a queen. So it's very, what these uh, experiments stand for is showing that how our nutrition, how our food actually can uh, change our uh, DNA expression, our gene expression, our protein expression. Our abilities. Exactly. Can be actually, can and can be we our... can be all queens, you <laughs> know. So um, coming back, the food and nutrition is really an epigenetic tool for us to change our destiny. We can all be very healthy, but it's all very important what you eat. So what is important for us to eat? It uh, we had in from the um, 1992 the pyramid uh, foods that were, we were told to eat and we were advised to eat. Don't eat fats, try to avoid fats and meats and stick to carbs. So that was, uh, I think it was very, we were very falsely uh, like guided uh, because fats actually and omegas are very, very important. They are uh, part of the cell, part of the membrane the flexibility of the mem uh, cellular membrane and how it can uh, transmit the, all the um, information. So it's, we shouldn't avoid fat, but also what fat is it's good for us. Not all fat uh, should be good. And uh, in general, um, our diet is based on carbo refined carbohydrates and meats and dairies, but this is not something that we need. It's something that we crave for, but it's not what our body needs. So um, speaking about fats, about cholesterol, for example, uh, I have here two things that I want to show you, and I want you to give me the right example, uh, the right answer if you can. So we have two eggs. Um, it's, it's said we should be very careful in eating eggs because they contain a lot of cholesterol. So I want you to ask you, which of these eggs contain more cholesterol than the other? Well, I'd have to say that I would think it would be the kinder egg, but the fact that you're asking me <laughs> would make me think that probably then it's, it's just, just the yeah. normal well, chicken egg. Um, it's, you're right. The chicken egg has more cholesterol than the kinder egg. But now, which of these two eggs is raising the cholesterol in our blood? Probably the kinder egg. You're right, this one. The, the egg, it's not we should avoid eggs. Uh, eggs have the, um, so many amino acids and protein, and it's very rich in all the metabolites that our body needs, actually, to survive. It's one of the most perfect uh, 
combine uh, has all the 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 particles and the metabolites but um, this one has a lot of sugar has a, has a lot of uh, refined carbs and fats that are not healthy it has more than two uh, tablespoons, full tablespoons of sugar if you break it down. So that makes the, the cholesterol is raising in our blood, sugar, not fat. More, it's uh, raising more cholesterol in our blood. Why? Because actually it's oxidating the particles that are transporting the cholesterol, it's called lipoprotein, they get oxidated and they are more susceptible to sticking to our ar arteries and uh, and creating the the cholesterol. So we're really doing our children a, a lot big injustice by hooking them on these type of things when they're little, than them craving things that are actually little by little destroying their bodies internally. Exactly. Basically. But they see this. They see this in a in an ad. They crave for it without even knowing what they, it's tasting. So when they receive in a supermarket, they will start crying, and moms, only by making them shut up, they will uh, buy one egg for them. But I think a lot of, again, is ignorance. We don't understand. In exactly. the sense, I don't think there is anybody on the planet who would give a plant Coca-Cola. Yeah, exactly. I just, th there's just no one, we would instantly know that that would not be good for that plant, and yet we do not even think about it when it comes to ourselves. We're not analyzing what we eat. I mean, Dr. Sebi very much talked about the acid and alkali. You talk about the acid and alkali yeah. being a cancer um, instigators also exactly. because we're eating the wrong things. Through biomagnetism, uh, through this amazing therapy, we are balancing out biological and energetically our body and all the organs. So we have a balance. But what people do when they are getting out of the, uh, of the clinic, that's very important. So animal uh, it's not that I'm against, uh, I'm against uh, meat eating. We should have very good protein, uh, good protein-based uh, nutrition, but plants are very important and we can, again, we have so many studies that back these things. Plant eating, it's very healthy, it's make, it makes us healthy and it's not uh, the compounds that have the plant, it's not the beta carotene. It's actually the carrot that that is important, because it's not only the beta carotene; it has all other uh, terp terpenes and other uh, products that help our body. And how our body reacts to to this uh, to this food is very important. We should teach our body to digest other things and to to learn how to cope with other type of food. So, for example, when uh, after a session, I'm recommending please stay away from gluten, please stay away from dairies and sugar because sugar it's very it's very bad, and it uh, your pH it will get very acid if you eat too much carbs or refined carbs or sugar. So people at one point they don't know what to eat. Uh, I had a patient that came and said, actually I don't have anything to eat because you cut all these things out of my diet. And I said, I told you not to eat three type of food. And thank you guys for joining us for another week of what's going on in Marbella now. We started off the program with obviously the sadness of Queen Elizabeth II having passed away. The funeral is on Monday. All of us are in mourning. I don't think there's anyone on the planet that hasn't been touched by her in some way. She is undeniably, um, a, a figure that we, of history. She, we've lived through history. Very sad. I'm going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm going to change the subject and say, rest in peace, dear Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, and God save the King. Long live King Carlos Charles III. Take care of yourselves. Be nice to each other, and I'll be back with more of what's going on in Marbella now very soon. You can check out recordings of the program from the RTV Marbella website, which is RTV Marbella. Dot TV, then slash Marbella dash now. You can also go to my website, NicoleKing.es, with links to the program, also to my Marbella Moment, my weekly column in the Euro Weekly News, and the Zero Hero website with an ever increasing list of venues that offer free soft drinks for the designated driver, promoting road traffic safety awareness 
in our beautiful city. Hasta pronto. Bye for now. You'll open up your eyes wide. You feel it's gonna go.